Okay. thought if I yelled you could hear me but um, so thank you for joining us this evening we're happy to have all of you with us I know some of you attend our meetings in person so that you can share your thoughts and ask questions during public comment while we are grateful for the opportunity to hear from our stakeholders Illinois boards of education rarely make a practice of responding during public comment this is done for various reasons but primarily to ensure that meetings stay on their published agenda, allowing for the completion of all business within a reasonable amount of time, and to allow for the gathering of all current data and facts prior to the board or administration providing a public statement or response. Going forward, when there is a topic with a high level of community attention brought to the board during public comment or via email, I will make every effort to pro provide clarity or clear up any misinformation at our next Board of Education meeting. My goal is to ensure that the students, families, staff, and community are aware and informed of the work of this board and administration. Tonight, I will address one such issue, our architect of record for upcoming facilities improvement. Last month, we heard questions and comments regarding the upcoming District 115 facilities improvement. Dr. Jennifer Hermes, our Chief Operating Officer, did provide important information regarding this upcoming project, and I want to take a moment to share that information once again and to provide a bit more detail to some of the specific concerns voiced by our community. Unlike many private entities, public schools in Illinois must designate an architect of record, and Perkins and Will is Lake Forest High School's architect of record currently. We have had a very positive working relationship with Perkins and Will for many years. The contract we utilize has been reviewed by our legal counsel within the last five years and was found to still be appropriate for our needs. Prior to engaging with Perkins and Will on our newest project, the district did consider the benefit of reevaluating our architect of record and determined that Perkins and Will's knowledge of our beautiful yet very old building was a highly significant advantage for this particular work. As we reported in the past, Perkins and Will has been working with the district on the planning, design, and execution of projects that will be completed during summer 2022. These projects are part of the health and life, life safety work required by the state of Illinois, as well as previously identified projects such as the historic windows at the back of the building. Based on the questions and comments previously brought to the board, I'm going to get somewhat detailed in my explanation as I want to be sure that the why behind the board's and administration's decisions are understood. Internally, all identified projects or repairs are thoroughly vetted by the district's director of building and grounds, Dan Mortensen, and his staff. Where appropriate, projects may be reviewed with outside contractors, engineers, or architects. Projects are then analyzed to determine how they will be addressed. There are many options that could be applied. They may be completed using contracted services. They may be completed or completely handled by in-house staff. They may be managed by a construction company with specs developed by an architect, engineer, or specialty. Determining which option to apply is based on the complexity and specifics of each project, in addition to the number of projects that are running concurrently. When outside assistance is needed on design or for the development of specifications, we make a determination on how best to acquire that assistance, either by using our architect of rec record or by using specialty companies or engineering firms. For our roofing project, we do not use Perkins and Will to develop our roofing specifications. We use a roofing contractor and consultant. For the upcoming parking lot, we are using our architect. 
It was stated during November's public comment that we do not need to engage the support of Perkins and Will for our summer projects, but that is not true. We must provide architectural drawings in order for this work to meet the legal standard school districts are required to follow. We are required by the Illinois State Board of Education and the Regional Office of Education to submit engineering drawings for a project of this type and size that are stamped by our architect of record. In this project, we are removing and replacing asphalt and potentially adjusting storm sewer catch basins, not just seal coating. These drawings will come from a civil engineer showing existing and proposed watershed plan, storm sewer and existing utility plan, along with a compliant parking lot striping plan. They must be specific to the project at hand, and we must keep in mind that we have high use drives with heavy buses running over them. Additionally, there's a substantial history of challenging soil on East and West Campus that significantly impacts the design process and needs careful monitoring during construction. In short, the board and administration believe this project to be co complex enough to warrant engineering, architectural review, and careful construction management, and that doing so serves the district's long-term interests best. We do the, if we do the work without adequate planning, we, we run the very real risk that we will have to spend more money in the near future to do it over again. While our staff is extremely competent and it is important that we apply their skills to our projects, it is equally important that we recognize where the projects exceed their capabilities. I also want to make it clear that all projects are competitively bid and all projects greater than $25,000 come to the board for approval. On a related note, the board and administration believe it is critically important to have our construction manager, Pepper Construction, involved in the pre-construction planning process. Marrying in-depth co construction knowledge with engineering and architectural services results in an overall cost-effective and time-efficient project. Past experience has proven how this has returned savings to the district. We have absolute confidence in our new Director of Buildings and Grounds, Dan Mortensen. Since joining the district team over the summer, Dan has been able to walk every inch of the facilities and grounds, review proposed projects with both internal staff and external experts, and develop short and long-term action plans. He has intensive facilities management and construction expertise. However, Dan actively manages two school districts with full-time staff in both. While it is unrealistic to add daily on-site construction management to his workload with two summer projects, which will require that, he will work closely with Pepper Construction and Perkins and Will teams to ensure the district's interests and needs are met. Another concern we heard is that the district did not have equipment or systems maintenance contracts to provide in response to document requests from the public. This does not mean that preventative maintenance is not being performed. It simply means that it is being performed by district maintenance staff rather than outside contractors. It also does not mean that a contracted service cannot be called out to perform service. It just means that we have not locked into a committed recurring contract. As your school board, we have sworn to be careful, prudent stewards of public funds. We do not take any decision to spend money lightly and often have said no to proposed costs. I'm hopeful that this information answers questions and provides clearer understanding. Please feel free to reach out to any of your board members with questions, ideas, or concerns as we truly work to represent you. That completes the president's report and I will now be turning it over to, um, pres or to Principal Lenart. You want me to go ahead and do the awards before? Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So we are going to um, move on to the all-in awards, which I have the good fortune of being able to um, address. As a reminder for those who were not present for the past few meetings, as part of the student and staff spotlight, we have created an all-in award, which will be awarded to members of our student body, staff, and community in the spirit of our students being all in every day. On behalf of the board, Superintendent Montgomery, and Principal Lenart, I would like to announce the winners of the All-In Award at this time. 
As I do so, if the, those of you who are present, please stand, um, and then after I've read off all the names, I'm going to invite you to come up here and join us. So our first award goes to a group of talented students. Andrew Turkelson, Sarah Mack, Juliana Brunetti, Siddhartha Oja, Tess Clark, Victoria Lang, Austin Wright, Ali Galliani, and Jensen Borowski. These students volunteered their personal time to support community learning and celebrations. Several students hosted the professional panels on the Lake Forest High School Career Connections Days, volunteering their time to host professionals within our, in our community as they presented and answered questions for our students. We also had the honor of having student host the annual Veterans Day Assembly, taking time to ensure that the military service of those in our community was honored. You all have truly exemplified what it means for our students to be all in. Thank you and congratulations, and would you please come up to receive your <laughs> Okay, our second award goes to Fred Marks and Sheila Bondock. Fred and Sheila have truly exemplified what it means for community members to be all in by generously donating two cars to District 115's safety and security team, including one with a custom paint job. <laughs> These vehicles are being used to patrol our campus and assist in keeping our facilities safe and secure. As we think about what we are grateful for this holiday season, our community members who give us so much of their time, talent, and treasure to our schools are certainly at the top of our list. Thank you and congratulations. Um, <laughs> I'm also going to come for oh that was that I'm going to come forward in just a moment because I have something you can probably sell for profit. I have lifetime Lake Forest High School event passes to any of these could be worth but your name's on them so you can't do that but I'm going to I'm going to give you these as well. So thank you to all of our winners, students, please <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, so now I will turn the meeting over to Erin to introduce our students for the student council update. Aaron. Awesome. And um, <laughs> it's off again. Oh, I'll do it. I'm going to turn the first part of my report over to Joey Nassar, who has the student update. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, it's Joey Nassar, student body president. Um, Johnny, unfortunately, can't be here because he has basketball that he's usually here for our meetings, too. Um, so yeah, so here's our 2021 December update. Um, so I guess the biggest thing that started is winter sports. Um, we've had recent performances from both our boys and girls basketball teams, as can see be seen from the pictures and if you go on to the next slide um, we also have gymnastics going on hockey wrestling um, swimming and 
gymnastics haven't had any competitions yet, but um, they're practicing and getting ready to go. Um, so students have been really excited to go to a lot of the games. Um, the basketball games have been especially packed, a lot of student sections and crowds forming there. Um, we had wrestling against Warren, which was under the spotlight, and that was really fun. And scouts cheer and dance competitions. Um, they went out, I forgot where it was, but they went out to compete and boy swim. My brother joined swimming this year. I'm excited to see how he does. I tried swimming one time and I quit after three days <laughs> because I forgot that you really have to know how to swim to do swimming, so. <laughs> but we've also had a lot more performances. We had Cedar present A Midsummer's Night Dream and I heard that was really awesome. Um, we also had band performances all in the, um, in the big theater we have. And we had clubs going on. We had speech team, debate team perform, and here's our robotics team also competing over the weekend. Um, this week, I'm gonna be bringing up a slide. Um, this week we had Winter Spirit Week. Um, yesterday was pajama day from, with my friend in his pajamas yesterday. Um, today was ski day, so we had a lot of kids. I had my ski goggles and hat on. Um, and the rest of the week we just have more things planned. Tomorrow is blanket day, so everyone's gonna be dressed up in their blankets during class. Thursday is anything but the sled day, so this is kind of creative. Basically, you have to find a way to carry all your stuff without using a backpack. So we're, we're excited to see what students bring out there. Um, we also have other games going on. We had elves in the shelves hidden around the school today, so students were able to get gift cards if they were, were able to find the elves that were hidden. They were like miniature elves, not actually life-size elves, so they're actually pretty difficult to find. Um, and then Friday, ugly sweater day. I think everyone's just excited to get into the holiday spirit. I think it's reducing the stress with finals week next week, and a lot of seniors are also getting college admissions decisions, so kind of a high anxiety time. But I think everyone's excited to get through winter break, and yeah, we have a spirit week planned for that. So I think that's basically it, but thank you. Thank you, Joey. I feel like you just gave my whole report, so that's pretty good, right? And also, I'll try to skip through some of them and, and abbreviate my report somewhat, but um, as you can see from my opening slide, I'm fully embracing the sunshine and roses theme that I usually have in these, in these presentations. Um, I actually have it on there this time, but it just gives me great pleasure to give the December report today. Um, there's a lot to celebrate. I think Joey already shared in a lot of that. So keeping with the spirit, of, a, of the season, if you will, I thought I would do like a past, present, and future theme tonight. So past, things that have happened. My first slide, you see a huge list of just sort of the life of a Lake Forest High School community member. Since our last meeting, we've hosted as a district not just one, but two of our Let's Talk series. Um, I hosted one over social media and Dr. Montgomery over COVID-19. I think if we look at the Nielsen ratings, I'm, ho I'm hoping that I'm a little higher, but I'm not quite sure on the one I, I hosted, but um, it was a lot of fun just to, <laughs> to answer the community's questions about social media, and I know I had the opportunity just to uh, tune in for Dr. Montgomery's as well. It was very informative. informative. Um, we also held our annual Veterans Day celebration, and I have to feature that we had, and we heard from a Scout alum, Spencer Oakley, and he eloquently spoke about why he has chosen to serve his country recently commissioning. Spencer's mom is currently seated two, two places down from me, um, and she actually has three sons who are serving in the United States military. So I think that that is an amazing gift, and I thank you for that. We also honored the American Legion Veteran of the Year, Eric Farr, who is a local uh, member of the Lake Forest Fire Department. I really didn't expect the ceremony to be as emotional as it was. I had the opportunity to stand up and talk about being a military spouse um, and my experience with a spouse who was deployed, deployed to war and what that was like for me. Um, and I really do stand beside my comment to the board last month when I said this is an incredible celebration. It doesn't happen everywhere. And I'm just honored to get to continue this most patriotic tradition. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful community celebration. Another hopeful tradition that's happened in the last month, we actually had District 115 participate in the Great Full Market. It was a pop-up farmer's market. It was amazing. It was on a Sunday, rainy Sunday, but so many of our scouts came out to, to support 
um, volunteering their time and resources to help support those with food insecurity at the Beacon Place in Waukegan. So what a wonderful community service event. Um, the show is definitely going on. Uh, Joey actually talked about many of the um, things happening in the arts. We have students who were in the freshman, sophomore play in Midsummer Night's Dream. We've had multiple recitals, concerts. So just last Sunday, we had that applause holiday concert. And I actually, I didn't sing, you're welcome. But I did, <laughs> I did get on stage and I had the opportunity to kind of do something a little bit corny. It was a lot of fun. Um, and it was just fun getting out and just being that person in front of the community and, and showing the students I can be goofy too. We have many academic clubs happening. Model UN's happening tonight, Scholastic Bowl. Full, at full speed ahead, you heard about robotics. Speech and debate competed last weekend. Just a lot happening with our academic clubs. And um, I do think it's really safe to say that we're not only, we didn't only have an awesome start to the year, we're really having an awesome year overall. We have students and staff who are showing up, and community members who are showing up in all the ways that really matter, to show up in all the ways that really matter. And I'm so, so proud of each one of them. Now for the present. Um, we are preparing for final exams. I'm surprised Joey's not hitting the door, getting ready to go home and study. Um, but I know emotions are really running high. I, feel the, I've, I have fielded a number of emails about that. Many of our students have not experienced final exams before. They haven't experienced them in the most traditional sense. We still have a lot going on in the background right now. And I just can't make excuses for all the emotions. I know that it's a lot for everyone. I don't have good answers. I really don't have good solutions. Um, and I do think we will need to, in the very near future, engage a much larger conversation around final exams in general. We do understand that most colleges do still have them. Um, and there is some benefit to these summative assessments at the completion of any learning. And also, there are many peer districts around us who are actually moving away from the traditional final, and they're moving towards projects and performance-based assessments as well. So we'll see. We'll engage that conversation in the future. We have finalized the book reconsideration procedure for our school district. I'm pretty proud we did that in a little over a month. So this means that if there is a community member who believes that a book should not be included in our library's collection, our director of teacher, teaching and learning would contact the community member, explain our library bill of rights, et cetera, and if their concerns should still need to be elevated, then there would be a formal avenue for that to happen. We're also in the middle of Spirit Week at LFHS, um, so if you see students downtown in any of the downtown areas in their cozy blankets or ugly sweaters, they're just having fun. I'm told that the theme this year was be chill. So we're just, we're just being chill to make sure that everyone, the tensions are running high. We're waiting on early decisions to come in. We're just waiting on a lot of things for our students eager to, eager to begin the holidays as well. Also just released is our school report card. And Dr. Wallert will be presenting the real time data and outcomes from last year. It's absolutely true that our results do reveal a decrease in SAT reading and SAT math performance. Honestly, there really was less than a school year last year. Many students were remote and some opportunities for students with regards to SATs that may have been there in years past probably weren't fully in place. As I compare the data, it's fairly obvious to me that this is and was the case across most public school districts in Illinois. As a matter of fact, across most public school districts in the country, and though I'm not trying to make excuses, I think there are reasons and there is compar comparable data. I also want to provide a little bit of school-based leadership context of the data for future implications. As we do some comparison data over the years, we always review our trends. We plan for areas of growth. We plan for areas of innovation within Lake Forest High School based on data. And it would be irresponsible if we didn't do this mindfully and being very critical of any data sets that we use as benchmarks moving forward. And here's the reason why. There are factors that led to this year's decrease and thus next year because of this year's uncharacteristically decreasing data, we might see an artificially large bump or increase next year. Our work my leadership work lies in looking at several data points. Dr. Wallert will share in many of those. Considering context, 
considering climate and ensuring that when we make improvement and innovation goals as a school community, we do so alongside our educators, we do so thoughtfully, we do so mindfully, we do so realistically and transparently. Dr. Waller will certainly have more to share, but I just wanted to provide our community with some personal leadership context from an educational leader and initial thinking from me. With that, uh, we do have the future. Um, now on to our future. We have lots for our students to look forward to. We actually have puppies and hot chocolate the next week, and I mean that, puppies and hot chocolate. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, just again, that chill experience we're hoping for. Um, by next month, I hope to be reporting on winter break, our upcoming annual scout experience. I'm told it's quite the show. It's going to be a lot of fun for our rising scouts. That will be on January 20th. And then the return of the fun and exciting talent show. I'm looking forward to that because there's so much talent at Lake Forest High School. So with that, I thank you, and I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you, Aaron. And now I will turn it over to Matt. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Jenny. Uh, tonight's presentation will cover the following topics. Um, they will begin with um, a COVID update, as always, um, and I'll be touching on current data, a summary of the Let's Talk program, as well as the governor's letter I just released this week. As uh, after COVID, we'll move into fast, uh, facility master planning update, a portrait of a graduate update, and then finally, uh, just a quick celebration of one thing that Aaron talked about, which is the tri-district uh, community outreach. I just included some facts and figures just to celebrate not only our partners and our sponsors, but what was able to be accomplished in that day. Beginning with COVID, uh, when you look at the data right now, it is um, no shock that our numbers are elevating across the county. Uh, right now for Lake County residents, it was 45.73 uh, cases per 100,000. Uh, in 60045, which is Lake Forest, uh, that incident rate was 28.39 per 100,000. Uh, Lake Bluff's numbers are much higher uh, in that they are 55.70 uh, for 60044. So those are our current rates as of this week. Um, and as we've seen in the past few weeks, the numbers are increasing. Thankfully, we are not seeing an increase in 115 in terms of cases, uh, but we are monitoring it closely, and you can see the breakdown on the dashboard that is updated weekly about what is happening in our school buildings. And that is of, um, as of December 3rd. We also offered a vaccine clinic uh, which many of you know about, but we are um, currently, I think today is the day that uh, the second dose is being administered for uh, those students uh, that are utilizing the option of Lake Bluff Elementary or those people who have the option of attending uh, the second uh, or getting the second dose at Lake Bluff. Uh, there will also be second doses administered at, um, on our campus on Saturday, uh, December 11th. So both of those are happening this week. Uh, and you can find out more information about the clinics on our website. And then I would also say that for any family that is traveling that would have an interest in uh, any post-holiday testing, uh, while not required, please be remi uh, reminded that we do have testing available on site and available to our families. Last week on Tuesday, uh, we hosted a, we've, we've hosted two Let's Talks, uh, like Aaron said, but last Tuesday was the one on COVID, uh, which I hosted, and I promised you that um, Aaron did a better job with her hosting than I did, a more celebrated uh, star. Uh, regardless, there was a great deal of participation, both in an online setting with questions submitted and in person. Uh, the online questions that were submitted ahead of time did not get addressed, or the bulk of them did not get addressed real time. Those answers were just released on the website tonight, uh, and we will be sending out a communication tomorrow with the link, but I did wanna say that um, they are available now, and I wanna thank the team for them creating written responses to the questions that we didn't have the time afforded uh, to actually address those in person. 
I am going to stick to the 60 minute experience. So if this is the format we need to do moving forward, um, please know that if there are questions asked that we don't get to, uh, we will do the same type of Q&A release of the documents to make sure that we're staying true to our commitment to engaging in thoughtful dialogue and being responsive to the, um, the community that we are proudly serving. Again, that's on the website just as of about 5 or 5.30. Uh, the next topic around COVID is many of you may know that uh, there was a letter that I released this week, uh, actually yesterday, forgive me, uh, we're in a time-space continuum sometimes, uh, so it was yesterday, and it was to the governor uh, as a byproduct of a conversation I had with the deputy governor of education last week, uh, talking about what are the potential off-ramps or uh, goalpost for moving um, school districts forward um, in the spring. And I came to that conversation with a, um, an option for the Deputy Governor of Education to consider, and that was based off of a pilot that was researched and tested in Ohio and then statewide implemented, uh, which is a mask to stay, test to play um, opportunity where students are given mask optional opportunities um, if the district so desires, and then they are asked to put on masks if they're deemed a close contact due to a school exposure. If they are engaging in athletics, uh, they are going to, uh, in the Ohio model, they are asked to mask up in all times except for during athletic play, um, and they then are asked to test at particular intervals uh, to in allow for their athletic eligibility to continue uh, to engage in the sport during the quarantine time. The reason that I gravitated towards this option is one, I don't like to be a problem identifier without being solution uh, minded. This is something that there is research to support that this is being successful, as well as I think it is an intermediate step from where we are to where we could be moving forward that would give parents choices, would decrease students um, need to be sent home during quarantine period, so there will be learning that would continue to progress, which will be paramount um, to an issue that we are addressing real time where how are we recouping the learning uh, that is being um, provided in a different way when they're not in school with us in brick and mortar. Uh, I wanna reinforce, as I said last Tuesday, that I am not advocating that this would happen now because of the holidays on the horizon and with um, the variant that we're exploring, um, as well as students just now having the opportunity to um, become vaccinated if they so choose. However, around MLK Day, I think that we're at a point where we can continue to have this dialogue in a real way because we'll be post holidays um, and then we will be uh, two weeks after holidays as well as um, everyone who has wanted the opportunity to vaccinate could. And then the third factor that is probably the most important is what, is the, what are the numbers doing? And how does that then impact the decision? The response from um, fellow districts has been favorable. Uh, to be quite candid, I have not got through all of the emails yet. Um, but the initial response has been there have been other area districts who are interested in exploring this option or partnering should the governor's office express an interest to do this in the coming months. Um, I will be circling back with the deputy governor this week. I put a phone call into Bob Morgan and Julie Morrison tonight before the meeting just to touch base. Did not get them but left messages. They'll call me back tomorrow, I promise, to just make sure that they got the letter um, as well as I will be uh, I'm continuing to try to actual make, actually make contact with the governor to engage in a dialogue. Um, but I'm most appreciative that the Deputy Governor of Education made time for me last week, and I'm uh, excited about continuing to build that relationship in the coming weeks and months because I believe it is our jobs uh, to continue to advocate uh, as we process through uh, the school year and beyond. Moving forward to the next topic, and that is a brief update on the facility master planning. There has been um, one oversight committee meeting, which occurred on November 10th, and the second one will be occurring next week on December 15th. That committee has been expanded from its original form, uh, and I'm excited to meet with the team next week to really process um, some recent focus groups we've done with the staff, both in person as well as in survey form, and then also discuss 
how we are going to best uh, set up the reengaging of the community during those open houses that we have dates set for um, in February and in March. Uh, remember, this process was underway uh, pre-pandemic. Press pause, and now we are exploring how to best move forward and what it looks like. Uh, the board received a update tonight, uh, and it was really just mirrored from what the November meeting was with the Facility Oversight Committee, because not all members are a part of that committee, so we wanted to make sure the board is kept up to speed. The board had thoughtful questions, as always, as we continue to figure out what are our next steps in this process. Nothing is set in stone, and we are pivoting based on the data points that we are receiving uh, to ensure that whatever we come up with will meet the needs um, of the community um, at large. You will see an agenda item tonight about a borrow uh, for projects that are related to infrastructure that we would be financing out of our own operating budget uh, that is independent of a referendum, and that is uh, ob or items that need to be done here and now that we will be um, financing through our general fund. So you'll see that happening. The referendum or the bigger project um, will be continued to be explored as uh, next week and into next school year and beyond. The third topic that I wanted to touch on is the portrait for graduate, which is what I've spoke about previously, which is really our visioning process. And that is a partnership between District 65, 67, and 115, working on developing key competencies and how that translates through all three districts, Lake Bluff, Lake Forest uh, for 67, and 115. So the Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, and Knollwood communities coming together and defining what the key competencies are for our learners, and I think that that work is extremely important as we figure out um, how to make sense of uh, where we are as a district and where we hope to be as a district or districts. And this unifying kind of concept is novel in that I don't think that we've engaged in this um, level of partnership in the past, and I think that it could really catapult where we are as three districts and moving in the same direction. Yesterday, we brought together the admin teams from 65, 67, and 115 to start to educate the administrators around what a portrait of a graduate is or a portrait of a learner. That was important because not every administrator will be serving on the design team, just, not, just like not every teacher or every community member will. The design team will be um, 100 members or more, uh, and it will be comprised of individuals from all three districts so the administrators having the where for all of what this process looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like was really important to me. And yesterday, Patel for Kids, uh, Stephen Fuji is the partner with, uh, that we're working with. He was in talking with the admin teams to ensure that they understood the process and could answer any questions that they may have. They truly are the leaders in the district, so them knowing what is going on um, is extremely important to me as well as the cabinet. The last topic is, and I'll be quick because Aaron talked about it quickly, but I just wanted to um, thank District 65, 67, and 115 to help put this together. And we had 150 um, families who had a more um, uh, wonderful experience in terms of Thanksgiving through this market. And when you look at the amount of um, resources we were able to provide, in Families in Need, it just brings me great pride that we came together as communities to um, make this possible for families in need. And then I want to thank uh, not only um, our adults who came, but also the students who came to help uh, make this possible. We had Spanish students uh, doing games in Spanish for the, some of the students. Uh, we made it a rewarding experience for all, and I know that um, the true art of Thanksgiving is giving. And I want to thank our partners and our sponsors as a final note, but um, certainly um, want to give them the credit that they need to do because it would not be possible without those partners and sponsors um, and the time and energy of everybody that came, to, to, um, came through to volunteer. And I want to give a shout out to our staff at LFHS, including Sydney Ragna, Ashley Malik, um, Dr. Sasson, uh, Corey Homer and Laura Clegg, 
And if I missed anybody, uh, forgive me, it wasn't uh, disingenuous. I will thank you as well. Uh, but it's something very special that we can offer and give back to our um, fellow uh, community members. And that concludes uh, the superintendent's report tonight. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matt. Does anyone have any questions? No? Okay. Um, we will move on to public participation. The board will now hear public comment subject to board policy 2 colon 230. The Lake Forest Board of Education welcome its public attendance and participation at all meetings. It is hoped that by utilizing these guidelines, participation will be maximized both in terms of fairness and organization. Um, at this point in the evening's agenda, this opportunity for public comment will be limited to comments about this meeting's agenda items only. Please hold all other comments until the following opportunity for public comment later during tonight's meeting. After being recognized by the board president, interested speakers should state their name and before addressing the board. Members of the public will be granted a maximum of three minutes each to provide comment on school district matters. Everyone has a right within reason to be heard respectfully. Members of the public will not be allowed to speak a second time until all members of the audience who wish to speak have been allowed to do so. Public comment should not be redundant and all comments should be directed to the board. To provide accurate response, detailed questions posed to the board during public comment will be listened to and taken under advisement. The public is always welcome to meet with school officials to receive information, discuss ideas, or express concerns. If the public has any letters or other written materials, they may be submitted to the board clerk for public record. Julia, our board clerk, will be timing public participation and will advise you when you have reached your three minutes. Thank you, and are there any members of the public who would like to address the board on tonight's agenda items? Um, it's Hollis Bloom. And I just, I have a question, question for you, Dr. Montgomery. Do you know if any other superintendents, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Do you know if any other superintendents have offered options for the mask return? Because I just want to commend you because it is thinking outside of the box and thank you. I don't think we would have had this if you had not been here. Thanks, Hals. I, I appreciate that. I know that a couple of my other colleagues, uh, in particular, a Barrington superintendent tonight is talking with his board about the same option. Um, it's no coincidence that both Bob Hunt and I are both from Ohio and we both know what's going on in Ohio. Um, I've heard other colleagues who are exploring options, so don't give me too much credit, um, but I appreciate your kindness. I have to give you credit for bringing it up. So even if it's not an original idea, you at least brought it to the attention of all of us and mostly to the governor. So hopefully he'll respond. Um, but thank you. It really is. It's, it's you know, when, when we confront problems, so often we never go around the problem. We try to, whatever I'm trying to say, thanks. Thank you for thinking it's outside the box. I love a good analogy. Um, and then my, my only other question was, how many incidents of COVID are there in our, in our county? Was it 45 out of, out of 100,000? Is that, is this even on? Is that what it is? 45 out of 100,000? Yeah, I don't have the decimal points up there, yes, but yes, uh, that's correct. That's why I was just, I didn't hear what it was. Okay. And so in Lake Forest, it's a higher percentage or Lake Bluff? It's Lake Forest is lower, Lake Bluff is higher. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Hollis. Anyone else? Okay, then we will be moving on to an assessment report with Alman Waller. Oh, yeah, we, we have a second public comment, but if you have something pertaining to the agenda, then speak now. That'd be, sure. Sorry, Alan. I guess I'm, I'm new here, so I'm not gonna make waves or anything like that, but I do, I am curious, and I haven't been able to figure it out since I arrived, um, just how many kids um, in our town, Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, are sick in the hospital with COVID? Do we have a, a, like levels in the hospital that we're looking at? Is you know, the, a part of 
the Lake County Health Department could give you that information. They track that. Okay, so we don't look at that at all. We don't have that information. Okay. We aren't we privy to that information. But they will give it to us if we ask for that. I you will have to reach out to the Lake County Health Department. I can't answer on their behalf. Okay. I just wondered if that was at all part of looking at our COVID mitigation strategy. If, if that was included, it seems important to look at that when including um, what to do. You know, if our kids getting sick or are they getting severely sick? And I, I just feel like that information would matter. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't mean to exclude anyone from speaking. Okay, Alan, I will turn it over to you. They need to be shorter. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So first of all, I just want to open up by saying that um, every year at this time, I look forward to speaking to the community and speaking to our board um, and just appreciate the opportunity to share our assessment report. This year, in doing so, the state report card came out earlier and it's allowed me to have a couple slides which, which address it a little bit. Um, and I want to be able to just open up by saying that you know, the last Alan, year. I'm so sorry. Uh, a member of the public has just asked us to identify you as the uh, director of teaching and learning at the high school. Apologies. I apologize. <laughs> so my name is Alan Wallard. I am the director of teaching and learning at the high school. Thank you. So our reality has been that um, the data we're going to talk about is about students at all grade levels that um, endured a pandemic and are coming out of a pandemic, hopefully. So I'm going to share a lot of data, but the one thing I will just say is I think that this is a really complex and multifaceted situation in terms of looking at data, both big picture and granular, around the performance of our students and, and their well-being. I will also open by saying I, I, I'm always so proud to be a part of such a high-performing school district. And at the same time, when we look at some of this data, I want to reiterate that we're definitely not content with the decreases that we saw in some of the key data points in 2021. There's definitely a lot for me to still unpack related to the school report card, but I'd like to go over a couple points and then we'll go on to the next slide. So Julie, you can go to the next one. There's only so much I can cover in a finite amount of time in a board meeting. The board report was more comprehensive, but normally this is about a 10 to 15, 20 minute presentation. And so we did see in ERW, ERW stands for evidence-based reading and writing. So think of a reading and English test kind of combined for the SAT. We did see a decrease of 11 points by state standards. I want to really make a distinction or a clarification between the Illinois state standards and the college board standards. Not everybody that doesn't do my job understands that. So our decreases were greater by the Illinois state report card, meaning their benchmarks are more stringent than college boards. I say that because I also place value in the college board's benchmark because we have students who have taken the SAT suite for now five plus years, and we've had many students over decades take AP classes and AP tests. So I do think there is merit and value in the College Board uh, standards, but on this slide, I am looking at them through the lens of the Illinois State Report Card. In math, we saw a decrease of 9% based on the state standard. But in both evidence-based reading and writing and in math, despite the dips, we still remain third in the state behind two other schools in the region, and it just kind of shows all the other dips that other area districts or the entire state had. So while I'm not content with these, I think there is context to the narrative. The school report card also showed 679 students ac accessing early college coursework. I'm incredibly proud of the gains that we've made over the last couple of years around dual credit. Um, we had dual credit new media when I got here, and over the last couple years we've added three new dual credit offerings. That continues to be a pathway for students to go to higher education and say they've taken a class and get college pet credit with a college transcript in their hand. And I think that means something incredibly powerful. And so that was a positive I saw in the school report card. 
I also had someone reach out to me last Thursday when the report card came out, uh, came out and said, Alan, why did we go from 99% to 96% of our current seniors sitting for the SAT? I think that's a really important thing I wanted to address. And what I just want to say is there should be no concern. And here's why. Taking the SAT is an Illinois state graduation requirement. We did an unbelievable job as a district last year. And by we, I don't mean me. I mean our students. I mean our staff. I mean our families. They came into the school and they took the SAT. It was a tremendous logistical, logistical challenge, excuse me, to pull off any standardized test in 2021. It was very difficult because if you recall, we had in some, during some of the durations, a cap of 50 people in one space socially distanced by six feet or more. The number of spaces across this building in the high school that we had to use made it incredibly complex to administer an assessment. And so when you see that small dip, what you need to know is those are students in 2021 who didn't come into the school. If you read the Trib article last Thursday, they talked about some districts just not having kids show up at all for tests, I mean ever. The kids that didn't take it last spring, they'll take it with us again now because they have to. It's a state graduation requirement. So there is that little dip, but I want to offer that clarification because if they didn't sit in April of 2021, they're going to sit with it in April of 2022 as a senior to fulfill that graduation requirement. Um, Julia, before you go on to the next one, I just want to say this next slide is to me maybe the most important one that I, I talk about tonight. Probably the most common question I've had over the last five days is, based on the data, what did you try to do in 2021 to support students, and what are you trying to do now? And I tried to encapsulate this in this slide. So Julie, if you can go on to the next one, please. I apologize in advance that it's so dense and there's so much language on here, but I wanted to keep my slides to a minimum and I wanted to address some important things. So during 2021, we ramped up our core team out of Ed Services and our cadre team out of Ed Services. And those teams basically existed to engage in early intervention on identified students who were struggling with the pandemic. We wanted to take a proactive measure or effort or attempt to know that kids were struggling academically or socially, emotionally, because things were so different. And so those two teams were really aggressive in trying to identify kids and get kids what they needed so they could still have some semblance of normalcy and feel support. And so I'm incredibly appreciative to them. We also have David Hain, our MTSS coordinator, multi-tiered systems of support is what MTSS stands for. And he has created data systems that are so sophisticated that in real time, we can get immediate data on students who are struggling academically and socially, emotionally, and utilize that data. And it's updated on a biweekly basis. And so he is so great at getting us data in a timely manner. This third bullet point, I think, is actually one of the most important ones, too. I had someone ask me last Friday about um, the need to get their child a tutor last year because of the pandemic. And that might have been the situation in, in some families. But I also know that our district does as good of a job as any I've seen at providing resource centers for our students to access support before, during, and after school. And those numbers are astonishing. Almost 4,500 visits alone to the Math Resource Center, the Science Resource Center, and the Humanities Resource Center is a combination of social studies and English. So when you think about students struggling last year academically, we really wanted to make sure they accessed our resource centers to find support. Personalized learning time, you might not remember this, but with that e-hybrid schedule we ran last year, our PLT time went to the afternoons. And that was done intentionally because we knew that kids were maybe struggling a little bit during the pandemic, getting up and getting going. We had the later start time, right? We wanted to honor that later start time for all involved. And so we made the PLT time in the afternoon and had tremendous um, attendance during that as well. We also ramped up our executive functioning support team. Last year, we averaged 40 students per week. But I wanted to actually bring up this year because I think that's more profound. Think of all the students that we know, and I've got them in my own house, who had trouble readjusting or reacclimating, if you will, to doing school this year. It's been hard. 
for all of our kids. And so we've actually gone up to 60 visits a week from our executive functioning support team, and they really are helping kids with the nuts and bolts of how to organize their time, how to structure that more traditional approach to coming to school and going to your classes and reorganizing um, and prioritizing. And so I'm incredibly appreciative to that team as well. Our peer tutoring team, think of students, largely juniors and seniors, going into classes, whether it was virtually last year or in person, being another system of support for the students in that class. So again, maybe you have a, a, a child that's a, um, a senior and they love physics and so they really want to help out in physics, that kid might be a peer tutor in a physics space to help other physics students. And so um, that has doubled so far this year in terms of the number of visits per week. We also continue with our free ACT, SAT test prep. I have a child that goes to another school and the fee was $250 to do ACT test prep and another $250 to do SAT test prep. And we do it for free here because we want to make sure all of our students have access to it and we had about 30% of our juniors last year participating. This year I have, I think, upwards of 125 students signed up, and I was here last Saturday, or at, at East Campus last Saturday, watching all the juniors trudge in at 8.55, not too happy that their parent or guardian had signed them up for test prep on a Saturday. But they're doing a great job, and they're coming in and accessing that, so um, that's important as well. The final example I want to give in terms of what we're doing about it is, it has to change in our departments, from a curricular and an instruction perspective. And what I mean by that is, kids coming out of 2021, I feel like our instructional directors and our departments have been thoughtful about gauging and measuring where our students were coming in in August and September of this school year. Many of them gave pre-tests, many of them gave assessments that really measured certain skills. It might have been reading skills, it might have been critical uh, thinking or critical writing skills. And then they used that data to try to meet kids where they were at this year knowing some of the gaps they would have in their learning because at the end of the day, we did have a loss in instructional minutes in 2021. The, the modified e-hybrid schedule that we ran ended up leading to a substantial number of minutes lost. And so now to, to readdress that, we wanted to make sure that we're aware of the fact that there was content, there were concepts, and there were skills that maybe kids weren't exposed to as deeply in 2021 because of the modified schedule that we ran. So, those are some of the things when people ask me, what did you do and what are we doing? I think it was really important that the community understands those things. And we're gonna to continue to do these things and be more innovative uh, when we can. Julia, thank you. So this is our ACT scores versus the state average. And it's always important, I've had to continue to tell this story over the last couple of years. The ACT, is still popular in District 115, but less popular in the state. And the reason for that, if you recall, is the ACT used to be a part of Prairie State six years ago. And then the state switched to the SAT suite. And so our students tend to take it on a Saturday, but we don't offer a school day ACT anymore. We do intentionally, I always make sure we're the host site for two ACTs and two SATs because I want our students to take it in our community. Um, just from a comfort standpoint. But um, last year in 2020, excuse me, two years ago in 2020, um, just prior to the pandemic really hitting, there was a score of the 28, which as you can see was unprecedented. In 2021, when the 304 juniors, now our seniors, did choose to sit for the ACT, we went back to a very, very common score of 26.3. And so um, you also see the black line, which is the state average. Again, remember the state average has gone up because it's a more select group of kids who are opting into still taking the ACT. Um, I wanna mention this too before I, I forget when we go on to the next slide. We are gonna continue to have to talk as a community, as a district, about the degree to which we're gonna gauge and measure students' proficiency levels on assessments that they may or may not see as high stakes. So like I see it as high stakes, but does a 17 year old see it as high stakes? The ACT could be dwindling in that manner as schools continue to go test optional. We just have to have those conversations. I don't have the answers yet, but we need to, we need to analyze the current landscape of that. Um, and so with the ACT, kids are definitely invested in that. But as we go, Julie, to the next slide, the SAT, I think is something that um, kids take the, SA, the SAT because it's a graduation requirement. 
But if you asked, and I have in the hallways, in classes, if you asked juniors or now seniors the degree to which they worry about the SAT versus the ACT, I think they'll tell you it's the latter because that's the one they have planned for and the one that they have decided to most likely submit. In unique cases, kids will submit an SAT, but most of the time in our community, they submit the ACT. So with this SAT, I wanted to give you a window into the current seniors. When they were in eighth grade, they take the PSAT with Dr. Sasson and I here in this building on a Saturday in October, and their composite score was a 963. This last year, um, it was an 1167. So they grew, but not to the degree, not to the degree, excuse me, that we would have hoped they would. And that speaks to some of the earlier data on one of the earlier slides that I presented that we saw these dips. Um, the other thing, too, that I want to go ahead and, and acknowledge is if you take a look at meeting the benchmark, always remember that to be, meet a benchmark in vernacular of assessments means that a student, if they meet the benchmark, should be able to go to college 101 class and get an A, B, or C. And so that is a little bit of a window into um, our current senior class and their SAT proficiency. So it hasn't grown to the extent I want it to, but it doesn't totally surprise me either given what they endured last year. The next one. I'm gonna switch into AP. Last year was the craziest year for AP I've ever seen, as you can imagine. The logistics that we had to endure were unbelievable. Students could opt for these three things. Are you ready for this? They could take an AP test in person with paper and pencil. They could take the test at home digital. And in some unique cases, AP tests were in the building, digital. So there were three different modes or delivery of the AP test, which made it very complex for us to pull off and to organize, and I think for students to take because students didn't all choose the same way of taking the test. I will tell you that right now, firsthand experience of working with them. But this, this data point is not something I'm tremendously pleased with right now, but again, not surprised. So when you see those high 90s over on the left-hand side of, of the slide, those are back in the days when much fewer students took AP classes. At that point in time, we were at 23, 24, 25% of the students at our school in one given year taking an AP class or an AP test. We've now more than doubled that. And I actually think our drops are negligible. They're not bad. But I, I'm not pleased from an 89 to an 83, but given what we endured, our teachers in AP worked so hard to prepare kids to the best of their ability. But again, the school year looked different. And the students will tell you and the AP teachers will tell you that it was a difficult challenge. So this is something I anticipate next year. Um, well, for April of 2022, I anticipate seeing it go back up. Julia? This is something I'm always striving for in working with our department instructional directors. This is a positive trend that I was alluding to a minute or two ago. The percent of the student body taking at least one AP exam has risen up to 42%. So that's a positive. Um, we want to continue to do that. Every year I stand before, year, before you and every year I continue to try to implement strategies to find more students to access AP. Because I still feel at the end of the day, while it's not the only way for students to experience rigor, I do think it's a good way for students to experience rigor. And I would like students, many of our students, if it fits into their schedule, to have that experience. And so um, this is continuing to trend in a positive direction. The other slide I wanted to share was related to students who have accommodations and access AP anyway. And when you saw that upward trend on the previous slide, going from 24% to 42%, we're giving more and more students access to rigor, as I believe we should, because we know that that's good for them. And we know that being in the space with other students gives them a sense of membership and helps them be active participants. If you take a look at the number of exams, the second column from your left, in the last three years, we've gone from 105 students to 177, excuse me, not students, 105 exams to 177 exams. And the number of students has basically doubled from 49 to 99. And so 
then, to your right, take a look at their success that they have, getting a three or a four or a five. So these are students who may have learning differences, they may have accommodations for their learning, but our teachers are working incredibly hard to give those students an opportunity to be in that space, but also to experience success. And so these are my closing comments, and boy, I thought all weekend about these because there's just so much to share in a short amount of time. I'm gonna reiterate, reiterate again that we're not content with the data that came out from 2021. I'm not pleased with the dips, but I'm not totally surprised. And we're working strategically, and I've already shared with you some of the ways that we're doing that. I also always think it's important to note that we are not a selective enrollment school. We welcome all students that walk through our doors. And when we look at a lot of the data, um, we think of the, the magnet schools and the selective enrollment schools in Chicago, just outside of Chicago. Um, I'm always very proud to be a part of such a high performing district. Not content with where we're at, but proud to be a part of it. I think it's also important to recognize um, our students, our staff, the district leadership at this office, the building leadership at East Campus, our entire community, our parents, our guardians, and I really wanna recognize our teachers for all that they did last year. Um, it's a really, really chaotic, different way of doing school, and it was very, very taxing on them, and it was very taxing on our students, and I felt like, um, I, I always wanna go back to August of 2020, when our community in this room said, let's create a plan and let's get kids back in the building. And it took us about six to seven weeks to pull that off. And I think October 19th of 2020 was when we did that. And we did it under a lot of constraints and a lot of um, logistical uh, barriers. And I'm just so impressed by our teachers and I'm so impressed by our students, by how they, they did last year amidst a tough time. And so we're gonna continue to acknowledge that those dips occurred and we're gonna hope to reclaim what we've done in the past. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions from the board um, if you have any. Alan, I have a question about AP. I was wondering last year, with the kids spending so much of the year remote, did you have an increase in the number of students, AP students, choosing not to take the AP exam? And if so, do you have any idea what, how significantly that number moved? So the number was significant and the number was troubling. And here's why. So think of when the pandemic hit, College Board told us, our students, all of our families, you don't get a refund. But wait, the test is in six weeks. I, I'm not, now what, what's gonna happen these next six weeks? You, you don't have to take the test, but you're not getting a refund. Most parents and guardians would say, hey kid, you're taking the test, right? In 2021, College Board allowed students and their families at any time, it could have been the day before the test, to say, I don't, I'm not taking the test. Mom and dad, I'm not taking the test. And you could get a refund for that test. It led to, in April and early May, a substantial number of students who just decided by their own volition, and with the support of their parent or guardian, that they weren't gonna sit for their exam. And so that also led to a decrease in terms of the number of kids that ended up taking the exam. Um, when, when College Board issued that statement in like August and September of 2020, I knew that that was gonna be a predicament. Every district had the same predicament, and every district can tell you they had the same story, which is if kids knew they could drop and get a refund, their parent or guardian was gonna be more likely to say yes, and I would include myself as a dad in, in, in that type of situation, probably if my kid said, it was a really tough year, I don't feel as prepared as I'd like. I think our teachers gave a valiant effort, and I think our kids worked hard, but it doesn't mean that the landscape didn't change last year. Um, so there was a sizable uh, decrease, so I'm glad you asked that, you're right. Alan, one other question <clears throat> in, that, in that regards. Do we track how um, Lake Forest compares to, to other districts in terms of the number of students who are taking an AP exam? I think it's one of the best stories that we have to tell in terms of really trying to engage every student, um, not selective, a selective group of students, but every student. And I think that slide showing that 42% of the students are now taking AP exams is terrific. Do we have a sense how that compares to other districts 
close to us and, and nationally? So I will tell you that, um, Julia, do you want to go back to that slide? Keep going back, I'll tell you where to stop. That one right there. If you look, Dewey, at, at like 2010, 2011, that was kind of like the, that early year of the 2010s, or the early years of the 2010s, excuse me, was when there started to be a push nationwide to say, don't only allow certain students to take AP and try to open it up. I think other districts will show those trends. Um, I don't know that they would have a percentage of 42 percent. Um, ours is high, but I still will say that I think ours could be higher. Um, it, is a, it is a comparable um, percentage to the area districts around us who have continued to encourage more and more students to at least take an AP class. Um, and so I would, say, I, said it, I would say it's comparable to area districts, yes. They've also engaged in that same intentional approach. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to committee reports. And Dewey, I'm going to start with you on the education committee. Great. I'm happy to report that we met this morning, approved a charter for our committee, um, had a discussion with Dr. Wallert about um, some of the uh, statistical analysis that they're doing in math and some of the engagement that they are working on to expand our math curriculum um, to make it more uh, forward-looking and, and to really provide opportunities for a broader set of um, students across the board. We also had a discussion of a vision statement that Dr. Lenart led. Uh, yep, so we did not meet. Uh, we've been talking, obviously, in uh, our workshops and some of the other things on a couple of action items that are coming up, so we'll talk about it at that point. But our next meeting uh, specifically will be in January, mostly regarding the audit and some of the other processes that will come, come forward. So um, the other items that we'll talk through are the tax and the uh, financing things. Again, several things we talked about. We'll cover them then, though. Thanks. I don't know if Sally wants to try and chime in on policy committee, or Sally, would you like me to ask Saver Marcus to speak on your behalf? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. loud and clear. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so the policy committee is meeting at least once and perhaps twice in January to deal with um, what Julia Polshkevitz called a doozy of Press Issue 108. Um, I will just let everybody's appetites by letting you know that there are 603 new reference pages and uh, 1,330 new footnotes for us to go through. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, we will post our meetings. We will do them in conjunction with 67. And because of the excitement, we may not be able to cover it all in one meeting. So I'm just going to add on to that, Sally, that at, there was an education conference in Chicago recently that I attended, and um, as did uh, Dave and Matt. And the uh, representatives at the state level from policy were there passing out little policy manuals that were actually squishy stress balls. So, Sally, you may need yours when you tackle the January meetings. <laughs> I will bring it. I would also like to say, as a lead-in to one of our action items tonight for Mr. Noble, that a large part of what's driving all of these mandatory changes to board policy is a very active legislature. So that may give John a, 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 a platform to start from when we talk about his action item tonight. All right. Thank you, Sally. And now moving on to liaison re reports, we'll start with John Noble on EdRed. Yep. So I didn't publish one today. Uh, not a big deal. But basically, uh, there's not a ton going on except uh, three things are in motion. So there's uh, draft legislation on the Finance Committee with EdRed that I'm on. Um, so we're waiting on TIF. Uh, 
uh, draft stuff to get that in. Um, these are needing to get in early in January for the draft and legislation for the spring session. Um, the other one, which is in process with uh, Senator Villavalam, we've talked several times, is what Sally's talking about with the mandates. So that has some actual real legs, so we'll see where that goes. And then there's a continuation of a piece of legislation on the grooming uh, that was passed in part, but didn't include uh, dismissal or uh, resign staff in terms of um, we're trying to rename it. So any ideas, rather than calling it pass the trash, uh, we're trying to come up with a uh, more polite maybe uh, type, but we're getting uh, legislation. And again, Mike Hernandez with Franzic has done a lot of pro bono work to help with that, which has been really nice of him. And so uh, those are the three things that are coming up and we're hoping to see drafts of that and uh, see if we can get some movement on those three pieces. So that's what's going on. Great, thanks, John. And our other John, John Venson, True North Educational Cooperative 804. Thank you, I've uh, included the superintendent's report from North from last month's meeting. I was not able to attend, but I was able to speak to Suzanne Sands, our su District 67 representative, and she suggested that I, the two areas that could be highlighted out of the report included the work that's continuing to go on um, with leasing and building out a space in Highland Park for uh, Highland Park transition students to get work opportunities as they transition out of True North. Um, that's an exciting uh, partnership for True North to provide home based. Um, work opportunities for these students. And the second one is that progress continues on the selection of a third party firm to facilitate their strategic planning starting in the spring. Thank you, John. And then Dave Burns, uh, Parent Support Organizations. Yeah, so I went to a couple meetings uh, this month, but nothing to report or nothing to highlight. This is the fun time of year when most of those parent organizations have their holiday gatherings. Okay, we will move on to action items. Um, the first being, uh, may, well, I'm just gonna step right in. May I have a motion to adopt the 2021 tax levy? So moved. Second. And John Noble, before we vote, I would like to pass it on to you to give a little update on this. Okay, so um, as part of our process, we always have the, in the fall meeting, to pass the tentative tax levy. Um, this will come to fruition sometime in April, uh, March. So if there's an adjustment needed or we're wishing to adjust what we're approving today, we can do so. Uh, but the purpose of this is basically to put forward what we are uh, proposing and this will go into the calculation for the county to basically assess and create the, the tax uh, statements and tentative stuff in the uh, for the spring. And so with what Jen and the committee basically was supporting was basically an uh, increase of 1.87 and to take the full uh, full allotment of that tax levy of what we could do. Um, and then the county will move that down based on what the actual limit will be. And then based on our uh, budget and some of the other things we will see after Christmas and early January, we could, if, if thought proper, we could then move down if needed. Otherwise we would stay at the level we, we, we propose or that the county actually then ends up giving. So the recommendation from the committee and from uh, Jen was to put in place the uh, 1.87 tax levy for us for recommendation, um, partly because of the, the difficulties from last year, some of the funding losses and some of the other issues. So to kind of right the ship, the, the, the ship a little bit on that, in that regard. Okay, any questions from the board? Seeing none, Julie, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Dr. Benson? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the IMRF authorized agent? So moved. Second. Rebecca, I'm gonna call upon you. Absolutely. So Carrie Allen, a longtime employee in payroll, had resigned uh, probably six to eight weeks ago, um, and she was the authorized agent for IMRF. We're excited to share that Carrie Steinhaus, who is our current staff accountant, is being uh, promoted into this role. 
and we need to have an authorized agent who performs all duties associated with IMRF, like ensuring that the right people are placed into the retirement system, the correct retirement system, and that communication between the retirement system and the employee uh, happens in a timely and effective manner. So we're recommending that you authorize Carrie, who is the new payroll person, as the authorized IMRF agent. Any questions from the board? Julia, may we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Noble? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. And Dr. Benson? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the Municipal Advisor Agreement? So moved. Second. Madam, I'm gonna let you tee this one up. Sure, just a quick reminder that you met with Liz Hennessy uh, at the workshop earlier tonight. Uh, she is a partner with Raymond James and Associates, and this action item is authorizing that she is our municipal advisor and financial advisor to facilitate the issues, uh, the issuance of debt, which is the next action item. So this needs to be approved ahead of um, us engaging in any short-term or long-term borrowing. We have a roll call vote, please, Julia. Oh, I'm sorry. Any questions, anyone? I think Matt, we all can you, could you speak to the purpose um, of this issuance um, or this or this request? That's the next action item. No, no. I think that you're asking what is Liz? What's her role as the advisor? Is that what you're saying? Jenny, Jenny was right, but I, I think it's I think it's useful to to speak a little bit about um, the purpose here. Um, and it, it may just skip a step later, but w the reason that we're, we're moving ahead this way. Okay, so may I have a roll call vote, please, Julia? Mr. Burns? Aye. Dr. Benson? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing and providing for an installment purchase agreement for and for the issue of not to exceed $15 million general obligation debt certificates, limited tax of the district for the purpose of altering, repairing and equipping facilities of the district and improving the sites thereof and authorizing the proposed sale of said certificates to the purchaser thereof. So moved. Second. Okay, now do we let, let's go back to your question. I'm sorry, I didn't. I no, 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 I, 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 I just put Matt. Yeah, so let's talk. So I'll talk a little bit and see if I've addressed the conversation or summarized the, qu the conversation we've been having and we had in workshop specifically just before this. Uh, we are asking the board to approve um, a short-term borrow of $15 million over the course of a 15-year debt schedule and that is to invest in capital improvement um, in the high school building as well as in uh, the West Campus of the building we're sitting in now. Uh, those are items that w need to be addressed in terms of infrastructure and will take place over the next three summers. And the issuance of that debt will be paid back through general funds. Uh, and there is a line item that is uh, allocated on an annual basis of $1 million for capital improvements. That is the line item that would be used to pay off this debt on an annual basis. And it will allow us to, uh, uh, in a very efficient manner, address some of the high need infrastructure issues that are um, uh, present in both buildings uh, that will uh, need to happen separate from or in addition to any referendum for the building project. So this is allowing us to uh, maintain the stability of the, the building itself, both buildings, but also give us a window to look at long-term what we wanna do uh, with LFHS in its entirety. One other, one other point that we'd gone through with Liz as well as in the finance committee is that right now um, our bonds are actually falling off in terms of what we have currently. So uh, next year we'll basically, I think it's about 836,000 is what you'll see. And the change in basically adding in a few more dollars in regards to as those come off and then be able to bring on this piece 
should will not actually touch the taxpayers in terms of how it's been structured as well as within the budget. So it's basically, it's, it's effectively running operations and running finance. And we've talked about this several times in the committee as I came on the board and other times is that just like in any type of a uh, corporation or type of entity, you would run some amount of debt to run and handle investments within the building, within the structure, within the company. And that's basically what's happening here. So as these are folding off and from the debt instruments in the past and the bonds, these are being replaced with new ones in order to do the things we need to. And there should be actually a high value of benefit to us to be able to take these things near term. And then as we identify, is there a referendum or there are types of things to move forward with, we then would shorten that amount of ask by this amount of investment. And if we look back to the last 15 or so years, one of the challenges has been um, both through the path to back to black and some of the other issues that we ran into, we did not have a lot of funds to do repairs and fixes. And so a lot of things that came back to me as a board member two years ago were things that were broken and they were fixing them in an emergency fashion but rather than planning and getting forward. And so this is a, a really healthy step to get us back into a motion of doing proper amounts of maintenance and fixes as the building ages and as just you would to your own home your own business and type of things. And that's been skipped, not blaming anybody in the past. It's just trying to get back to a better operational structure. And so I think this is a nice, healthy step. Um, Sally, uh, I'll give you any other additional comments on that, but I know it's been an active conversation with you and I for a while, as well as a desire by Jen. And this has been something that in District 67, they've functioned in this manner. And I think it's been very healthy for them fiscally. And I think it's, uh, it's a good step for us as well. Nope, cannot add one more thing. You did it exactly right. Fully agree. I'll make one, one additional comment and I'll, I'll applaud the work that Jenny and John Noble did and others, many others did with the facilities master plan in the past. It prepared us to be in a position to, to, to ask to, to go out and to try to raise these funds so we can fund needed repair and improvement in the high school building over the next couple of years in a really thoughtful and um, well-planned way with I think a, a terrific team with Dan Mortensen leading the effort, um, working with Perkins and Will. I, I, I think we're really well prepared to do this work. We're raising the funds at a, at a good time at a really attractive rate and I, I think it's really good for the school and the community. So thanks again for that great work. Anyone else? Okay, Julia, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Zinzer? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Dr. Benson? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the District 65, District 67, District 115 state legislative priorities for 2021 to 2022? So moved. Second. John Noble. Okay, this is the last time I'll talk, I think. Um, anyway, so this is some work that started, uh, I guess last year or the year before um, around stating some legislative priorities uh, for the public and for people to understand we function very slowly as a board and we can't be up to date with how the legislation works. So the legislation, uh, legislators don't do anything for a long time and then all of a sudden they do a tons of things in a week and then we get veto session and everything happens in hours. Um, and then we get stuff signed by the governor. So really what we followed was a model that Barrington did, which was actually publishing their legislative priorities, their vision, uh, their approach, their philosophy. And it was something missing in terms of our district. And so as we prepared that um, last year and formally passed it, we then introduced that to District 67, because obviously that's kind of part of us. And then uh, as well brought it on to District 65 and Lake Bluff. And so uh, we made that continuation into this summer and did work with um, uh, Mark Berry's support being the president of District 65, uh, Amy Donahue and um, one other names escaping me, I should have written it down. Um, but then we also had support from District 67 with Justin England and Carl Carrar. And so we met several times to discuss where we were in the past, what we had approved in the past, and then how to simplify this and direct this. And so this effectively gives us a way to go forward to the Julie Morrisons, Bob Morgans, the Governor Pritzkers of the world to say, this is what we believe, this is what our community believes, this is how we wanna run our school and our districts and our thought. 
of what we think needs to happen. And this allows us to actually hold them to account and say, look, they did not support us. They did not do the things necessary. And I think then we can collectively work together as a community to say, we'll vote for somebody else next time. Um, but I think without putting this type of stuff down and how we need to think and move forward, it's very hard. Um, it gets very emotional and it gets real easy to, you know, have a bumper sticker and say this or say that. So these are the things that we believe. This is the stuff that allows us to d d demand what we want as local control. And I think in some small way, it gives us a little bit of a foundation for Matt to do what he's done in terms of reach out to those people to say, this is what our community, this is what our board is saying. This is what we're standing for. And this is what we want. We want to bring back the control and the lack of man. We don't want more mandates. We want essentially a little greater freedom to do something when we're doing things very well already. So that's what this is and represents. Uh, District 67 was kind enough to support it and vote yay already. Um, I think 65 is in the next day or so, or maybe before, I can't remember, um, but I believe they're fully supportive of it. And so it is, is our turn to uh, ask questions or vote yes or no for this. Are there any questions for John? I know we did talk about this a little bit at last month's meeting. All right, I don't have a question, but I do want to extend my gratitude. I can tell you we would not be voting on this action item tonight if it weren't for the very hard work of John Noble, who spearheaded this, brought 67 in, brought 65 in, and really said that, you know what, there's serious work that needs to be done on behalf of our district and our taxpayers and our students and our teachers. And so John Noble, you deserve gratitude from everyone in this room and everyone in this community. So thank you very much for this great work. Here, here. And with that, Julia, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Benson, or Dr. Benson. Aye. Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner. Aye. Dr. Schaubacher. Aye. Ms. Zinser. Aye. Mr. Burns. Aye. Mr. Noble. Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to approve the human resources items as presented? So moved. Second. And I know our board has discussed this. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, Rebecca. I, I don't think there is, Jenny. The cover letter s really states everything, and it's pretty standard operating procedure on the hires. Um, and there is one, one termination that happened since uh, the last time we met. And I will publicly voice what was said in workshop, and that is a thank you to Pete Tice for putting that memo together. That was really helpful for not only the board, but for the community that looks at, looks at the board packet. So any questions or comments from the board? Okay, Julie, may we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Burns? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Dr. Benson? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, agenda items, including approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements, July 2021, minutes of a regular meeting and workshop, November 9th, 2021, minutes of a joint special meeting, November 9th, 2021, minutes of an executive session, November 9th, 2021. So moved. Second. May, I, I don't believe anyone has any questions on these. Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please, Julia? Jenny, before I do say, I wanna apologize. I forgot to remove the financials from uh, your sheet. We are oh, actually gosh, going to move right, them to next right, month. Right, so that, was, right. that was my mistake. So we're just approving three sets of minutes tonight in the consent agenda, my apologies. I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. So I am removing approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements, July 2021 from tonight's consent agenda. And we are voting on minutes of the three meetings I already mentioned. May Thank I have you. a roll and call vote? My please. apologies again. No problem. Dr. Schaubacher? Yeah, aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Dr. Benson? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Motion carries. Hoyer requests Jeff Brinkett, status in progress. Dan O'Neill, status in progress. We, at this point in the meeting, are um, to our second opportunity for public comment. Um, per board policy 2 colon 230. Uh, this is an opportunity for the public to um, comment. We're going to set aside 60 minutes this evening. I hope that is enough. And um, just to reiterate, after being recognized uh, by the board president, 
interested speakers should state their name before addressing the board. Um, I don't know that I really need to read the rest of this because I think, every, was everyone in the room here for first public comment? Anyone who was not? Okay, then I'm going to read it. Um, members of the public will be granted a maximum of three minutes each to provide comment on school district matters. Individuals that have signed up for public comment cannot yield their time to other individuals in an effort to give others additional time above three minutes. All those speaking are expected to act with respect and civility and to conclude within three minutes and, um, and if requested by me. Everyone has a right within reason to be heard respectfully. Members of the public will not be allowed to speak a second time until all members of the audience who wish to speak have been allowed to do so. Public comments should not be redu redundant and all comments should be directed to the board. To provide accurate response, detailed questions posted to the board during public comment will be listened to and taken under advisement. The public is always welcome to meet with school officials to receive information, discuss ideas, or express concerns. If the public has any letters or other written materials, they may be submitted to the board clerk, Julia, uh, for public record. Our board clerk will be timing public participation and uh, will advise when you have reached your three minutes. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the board? I was about to adjourn. <laughs> You'd be surprised if I didn't, right? I thought, I thought that's why you were here, Jeff. I thought you had something you wanted hey, listen, to share. I don't need to disappoint anybody. Um, my name is Jeff Brinkhead, 16 year resident, six children, four of them still in the school system. Um, I got to say, Dr. Lennart, Dr. Montgomery, I'm gratified to hear what I would classify as you guys owning the issue about the testing. Then we got into the other portion, and I'm not so sure. So I was quickly changing the comments I wanted to make. Um, I want to share a quote with y'all, and maybe you know it, no bird soars in a calm. Anybody know what that's from? It was written by Wilbur Wright in 1900 on the banks of Kitty Hawk as he was studying the birds flying around, and he, and he noticed that in the absence of wind, in the absence of the carcophony of, of angst, birds rarely soared. So I would argue to y'all right now, and my support of this board, that with these scores being the way they are, this presents a tremendous opportunity for this board and this district to re-examine every practice that we're involved with. Everything, everything in structure, and, and look at everything we're doing to do the only important thing we do, and that's educate our children. That's the only reason we're here. Look around. The building, the custodians, the cooks, the maintenance people, these meetings, the top who's left, the only reason we're here is to produce an adequate educational product. So this is about as much as overcoming resistance. I didn't hear one person say what the scores are, but we have a third of our students not meeting standard. I didn't hear anybody say that. And I say that in support of this board. We have a third of our students not on standard. Now I can't imagine anybody's happy about that. I'm certainly not, and I, I'm trying to put myself in y'all's position. I don't think anybody here is. The Wright brothers knew in a shortage of turbulence, you won't have the confrontations you otherwise need to resolve these issues. And that's, that's what I offer that we're at today. The hardest thing is to stay the course in these difficult things and reaffirm what's important to us as a board, as a district, and as a student body. But amidst this strife, we really can do our best work. But a third of our kids are not at grade level. A third. These were last season scores. What do we think they're going to look like next, next time? I understand. And as somebody who did statistics for years, I get it. You can slice and dice this a lot of ways. There's a lot of data points, a lot of cross tabs. But it's a third. Despite plenty of warning and reassurances that we were dealing with these things, it's still the third despite repeated assurances they would not suffer, they have suffered greatly. It's a third. Under the, under the full watch of ISBE, Illinois Department of Public Health, this governor's administration, our own board, and our administration, it's a third. The entire reason we're here is to produce this educational product that we all want to be proud of. And I know everybody agrees with that. I know you do. And I implore you to turn over everything we can to do it, starting today.
If we leverage the turbulence that exists right now, we do have the ability to come out of this on the other end of the pipe with a product that is unparalleled. And not unparalleled by comparing to other people, by doing what we know is gonna work. Thank you so much, three minutes. I'm almost done, I promise you I'm gonna go fast. In the Chicago Public High Schools last year, Mayor Lightfoot with Dr. Carmen Ayala touted at 84% graduation rate. They graduate 84% of the students in the Chicago Public High Schools. And everybody said, oh my God, we died and went to heaven. 84% of our students graduated. 13% could read at the 12th grade level. 11% could do math at the, at the 12th grade level. But they graduated 84%. We can rationalize anything. And I know you agree with me. Self-denial is the greatest force in human history as it relates to achievement. 84% graduation rate. 13% competency in reading, 11% competency in math. Thank you, Jeff. I'm almost done. Vince Lombardi once said, we're gonna shoot for perfection. We'll probably not achieve perfection, but if we shoot for perfection, we'll achieve excellence. Let's not compromise our standards. Let's not explain anything away. You have the support of the community, but like a restaurant that you go to and it's too cold, the hostess is an asshole, the waitress is no fun, but if the food's good, we come back. Yeah. It's the same thing here. If we we hear you, if we but your three minutes product, are up. Everyone will be okay I am with asking everything else. you please to Thanks take for your time. Seat. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Hello, uh, my name is Andrea Baldi. I'm a resident of Lake Forest. I have three young children, graduate of Lake Forest High School in 1995. Um, first, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Leonard for um, putting in place the reconsideration process for, for the book that I have um, come to learn about. And I don't, I wanna keep this brief tonight. I don't wanna get into details, but my concern um, with the review process um, I notified the school originally on October 4th. I was, um, Dr. Leonard was kind to put that uh, process in place. I was notified by um, Alan on uh, November 23rd, and he said that a uh, committee would be set up. Um, I came to find out that two students will be on the committee. Um, normally I would think that this is fine. It's great to involve students with something like this. But the problem is that this book Gender queer violates the material selection, the, violates um, from the material selection of the library, the policy in which the age, the ability, and the emotional maturity of the child um, is considered before selecting the book. Um, when you have a book that um, hypersexualizes children, it is not appropriate for uh, then students to be judging that book. The other thing that I think has happened during this time period is kind of the narrative at the school among students from articles I've read written by students and among teachers is if you don't support these reading materials, you don't support the LGBTQ community. I can't say that is totally 100% false. Whether you have um, illustrations with a heterosexual uh, children engaged in oral sexual activity or if you have gay children engaged in oral sexual activity, it's not appropriate for children. So that is 100% false. And I was just concerned after reading an article written in the Forest Scout by a student. Um, first, uh, she talked about um, the a Lawn Boy, a different book, where two 10-year-old boys were in, two 10-year-old boys, okay, engaged in an oral sexual act. Um, I have a nine-year-old daughter and an 11 year old child. If I found out at any point they were engaged in that sort of sexual activity, I would assume one of them was being abused. So to normalize this, th why is the school normalizing this hypersexual behavior? I don't understand this. Um, child sexual abuse victims are abused by someone they know, someone they trust, they use grooming tactics, tactics to normalize sexual contact and behavior. So what are we doing? Why are we doing this to our kids? 
it's not LGBTQ. Find me an LGBTQ book. Find me one without oral sex in it. I'm all for it. I think 95% of the parents are okay with it. And again, I didn't want to address this till after the reconsideration process, but it has taken quite a while. And from just talking to students at the school, reading some of the articles that have been posted online, I've just become so concerned about left. how this is getting spun. And I just want to make sure that we're keeping our eye on the ball. So at the end of the day, like Jeff said, we're here to number one, educate our kids. And I think equal to that, or more important to that, is to keep them safe. Thanks, Andrea. Do you mind if this is down? You're the mandate is still in place, so I do need yes. Okay. My name is Jameson Starks. I've been a tenure resident, three kids. I stand before you today as I'm being sued by Dr. Marcus Schaubacher, as well as another family member. I stand before you right now because I supposedly defamed him, because his son posted photos of himself drinking and smoking. Sir, I don't believe this is board public business. Well, yeah, because I'm being sued based off of what I said at a board meeting. Have you seen it? Our attorneys have advised us that this is a topic that uh, doesn't belong in this boardroom. So. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I guess you, if you would have known that. But I just want to let you know this that this is a personal. This is a personal matter, and therefore it is not board business. So, if you have board business, you would like to bring. Yeah, it I just th that's and fine. I appreciate it. But I just want to let you know that the board members now suing parents, and maybe that is why we have less parents here tonight because we are now fearful of the fact Again, that we're going to be sued by board members for speaking up. And if you thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything for the board? Patrick Patton, I don't have any Wright Brothers stories, but it brought something to mind. Uh, we had a very bad blizzard one year but it wasn't bad enough to call school off. And so I had a mother call me very upset that the bus was five minutes late that morning to pick their child up. And I ended the conversation with her by just saying, do you think your husband who works downtown got to work on time? I think it was very evident that the school year with the pandemic was a very unusual one. The drop off would be expected. You know, I don't care what data points you want to use. It seems like that was prevalent throughout the entire state of Illinois. And so I wouldn't go running in fearfully to say, whoa, the academic program is falling apart. I would like to, and all I was going to do before I heard Mr. Brincott do his thing, was to say thank you to all the people sitting at that table. In fact, and I don't want to say that to Dr. Montgomery because he gets paid for this, but there are three board members sitting at the table that were at a meeting for two hours this morning. And now they're sitting here tonight listening to this again. And, you know, fearful about speaking? No. If you speak the truth, you don't have to be afraid. And so I will just leave it at that. Keep doing what you're doing after all the years of watching school boards and school people the people of Lake Forest are very lucky they have all of you. And I'm a 32-year resident of Lake Forest, so I've got the other two gentlemen added together beaten. And I have also have 50 years in education, so I have a comparison that I can make here. And I really appreciate everything that all you guys do. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Okay, seeing none, I will move on to announcements. December 13th through 16th, 2021, first semester exams. December 17th, 2021, faculty workday, no school for students. December 20th, 2021, until January 4th, 2021, is winter break, no school for students and staff. January 5th, 2021, school resumes and second semester begins. January 17th, 2021, Martin Luther King Day, no school for students and staff. 
On Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, there will be a special joint Board of Education meeting here at Lake Forest West Campus in the boardroom at 515. And on Tuesday, February 8th, 2021, this Board of Education will meet again at 7 p.m. in this boardroom at Lake Forest West Campus. May I have a motion to adjourn the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 board meeting for December 7th, 2021? So moved. Second. Second. May I have a voice vote, please? All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.